we're talking about MCAT Foundational Concept 9A, and the topic for today's discussion is addressing health disparities. Now, you might remember that we defined health disparities earlier as being disproportionate differences in the health or health outcomes within a given population. Now, why is it important for us to talk about how to address this? Well, that's because when it comes to dealing with patients that have health disparities, we need to come up with solutions that are feasible and realistic, given the limitations that they have. Okay, so let's talk about an example of this. Let's say that you are volunteering in the primary health physician's office in your hometown, and he has a 79-year-old patient who comes in, and one of the health problems that he has is hypertension, high blood pressure. Now, we have things in medicine called standards of care or protocols, and these protocols are usually written by organizations like the FDA or the CDC, and what these allow us to do is to use evidence-based medicine in our decisions about how we're going to treat people. And so not only does this allow us to incorporate new research and development into our current treatment plans, but it also somewhat ensures that all physicians throughout the the country are using the same methods or the same treatment plan. Okay, so the protocol for hypertension tells the physician you're working with that he needs to do three things. He needs to give this patient medications, he needs to advise him to change his diet, and he needs to tell him to exercise. So your doctor prints out a prescription and he gives him the prescription for medication. He gives him a printout on dietary changes, including some foods that he should be eating and um, how to cut sodium out of his diet or decrease the sodium intake. And he tells him that he wants him to walk for 30 minutes a day. Now, our patient is fine with walking. He does not need a walker or a wheelchair, so 30 minutes of walking should be fine for him. So this patient leaves the doctor's office and he goes to the pharmacy. And when he gets to the pharmacy, the, he finds out that the medication is going to cost him a $30 copay. Now, for you and I, that might not be much of a problem, but as it turns out, the $30 a month is exactly what his electricity bill is. And he's 79 years old, he's retired, he's on a fixed income. And when it comes between having to choose between his electricity and this new medication that he didn't really budget for, well, he's gonna skip his medication this month because he can't afford it. All right, so let's think about diet. So we've given a, the patient a handout on what kinds of things they should be eating, but in our case, our patient is actually getting food from his family. He hasn't cooked for himself in a number of years, and he has grown children that live in his town, and they drop off food to him that they eat every day. And he mentions to them that he needs to decrease his sodium intake and increase more fruit and vegetable intake. But as it turns out, you know, his family, they're not just making food for him, they're making food for their families, and they just don't have time to make him special meals. I mean, it already takes time to drop off the food, so he can't change his diet because he has no control over this. Fine. Let's talk about exercise. So 30 minutes of walking a day, that seems perfectly reasonable. Well, something that the patient didn't tell the doctor is that he's been having vision problems lately. And you may find out later that he actually has cataracts and he tries to avoid walking around the neighborhood because he's actually run into things and he can't see things well. And so he's fine in his house. He knows his house and he doesn't drive. I mean, he has his kids to drive him to appointments and whatnot, but he can't exercise because for him, it's a safety issue. He might hurt himself. So here we have a perfectly good protocol 
that has been shown to work and that for you and I would be fairly easy for us to do. We can get medications. We can change our diet, even if we may not want to. We, we can exercise or we should be able to exercise, but for this patient, it's impossible. So what do we do then? Well, there's an approach to treating patients called, whoops, situation-based interventions. Now, this is a term that the WHO, the World Health Organization, several other public health agencies use. And as you might be able to figure out from the name, situation-based interventions are based on a specific group of people or a specific location and they're meant to help us execute these protocols, these standards of care for people that don't have the same access to resources that other people do. What this means when we're addressing health disparities is that we need to come up with creative solutions. Okay, so how do we do this? How do we come up with situation-based interventions? The first thing that we need to do is go to the patients. Now, let's say that we want to start an exercise class or maybe like a Tai Chi class for our patient in the example. Well, if we're doing it 40 miles away from where he lives, that's not going to help. Or let's say we want to do a seminar on nutrition for an area with lots of, of young mothers that want to know how to, how to give their children healthy food. Well, we need to do it in the place where the people can actually access it. Now, something that we need to do while we're there is actually teach people. Now, having the knowledge yourself through education is a lot different than having somebody tell you to do something. And by giving people the opportunity to learn about their disease or the intervention that you would like them to do, that helps a lot with their compliance, with their willingness to do it, because now you're not telling them to do it. Now they understand why they're doing it. Now, when you're teaching and giving people education, you need to focus on specific problems. So when with our patient that has a problem with hypertension, we're not going to invite him to a seminar on alcoholism if he doesn't struggle with, with alcohol, because that doesn't make sense. We need to think about what the specific problems are for an area and focus on them one at a time. We talked about when we were identifying health disparities that in regions where there is a, a health disparity, there are lots of things going on. Um, there's increased hypertension, obesity, increased rates of infant mortality, cancer, AIDS, but Attacking them all at once is not effective, both for you as a teacher and for the people that are living there that are trying to absorb this information. So we have to focus on specific problems one at a time. Now, this one may seem pretty obvious, but you need to involve people. And when we say people, we mean specifically women and children. Now, children are an awesome resource when it comes to these interventions because research has shown not, that not only do children retain what you've told them, but they teach other people and they develop lifelong habits. So if you can teach a child early on the importance of exercise and a healthy diet, this is something that they can share with their friends and that they're going to carry for the rest of their life. So you want to make sure that you're involving people. And finally, you need to create places and spaces where people can actually have these interventions. Now, on the AAMC website, you'll see that there's a lecture by Dr. America Bracco called Health Disparities in Healthy Cities. And one of the things that she talks about is a community in Santa Ana, California that doesn't have parks or playgrounds. So she brings mobile exercise units to that area. Now, that's a very specific example 
example of executing this, but there are other things that you can do. You can petition for things that are needed, playgrounds or parks. You can create safe spaces for kids to do homework after school or to, to gather with others, but you need to make a place and a space where people can actually carry out these interventions.